symbolize as. And again, what we're really trying to focus on is protecting children from falling into the river in the first place by building bridges across them, or if they are already in the river, trying to make sure that they stay safe and aren't in any danger in going down. So one of the resources that we have in the roadmap is this Understanding God's Heart for Children. It's... Um, it's one of the most complete ones that we have been able to find, and it has been developed by um, leaders from low- and middle-income countries um, around the world and revised three times. The thing that we really thought was strong and powerful about it is it includes all of your standard kind of Bible studies that help believers work through, like just coming to conviction about what God thinks about children. But it also includes two chapters about working with two um, sessions about working with governments and how you can pull out some of the key parts of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and some of the key values there and compare them with the key values of Scripture and show that they're um, aligned rather than. Um, you know, oppositional, because in a lot of countries where there is opposition to believers or to Christians working in some of the areas with children, ha being able to show that there's alignment can be really helpful. So uh, we really, while the focus of the prevention section is um, making sure that we are taking some of the program resources that research shows works to believers. We also started out with really wanting believers to be grounded in what the scriptures say about God's heart for children. So that is the resource there. And um, you're going to see this several times when we're here, and I'll uh, share a little bit about how it came to us. Uh, I was actually about four years ago driving one day in Atlanta, and I, I felt like, because I'm a, um, a scientist, often I feel like God speaks to me in models, but I, I, uh, I had this uh, uh, image in my mind of this huge upside-down triangle, like as, bi as big as the whole city of Atlanta, which is five million people, and so obviously it was very big, and um, the bottom is kind of like an ice cream crack cream cone. And the bottom little piece of it is the number of children in orphanages. Most of them are what we call social orphans because um, they often have a living parent, but the parent can't take care of them. And that's like the little bottom of the ice cream cone. And then next is the children who have lost one or both parents, 153 million of them globally. And then the next is the children who are experiencing abuse and neglect, physical, sexual, or emotional violence every year. And that's a billion or one out of every two. So before you can, we can really go in and develop a without orphans um, initiative in a country, the question we have to ask is, who is the orphan and how many are there? And if we think the orphan is only the, the ones in institutions, then, you know, in Rwanda, they only have 420 kids left in institutions, and you'd think, well, as soon as they're all out, our problem's done. But it's, it's really not done, because there are still so many children that are vulnerable who aren't in institutions. And in most of the countries, most of the vulnerable aren't in institutions. And in fact, a lot of the ones in institutions are a lot safer than the ones in the top part, because the ones in the top part are the ones who are being raped repeatedly, and getting no help at all, and having to no no choice but staying in that exact home where they're being raped. So that's why we care about them. But um, uh, this is the other thing I was going to say about um, having this um, image or model in my mind. It's you know the little bottom part of an ice cream cone. What happens when you bite it off? The rest of it falls down, right? So basically, um, all of those children, we're never going to get to a without orphans place if we're not addressing the root causes of um, vulnerability and orphanhood in the first place. Then um, I just like this reminder that even though one billion is a, good, is a huge number, it's one out of every two, and if we can think about the one, it can really help us have courage to move forward. This is just a picture of what happens in the brain of children who grow up in stable families and homes on the left. The um, areas that are in the circles there, the temporal lobes develop well, and when you have children repeatedly exposed to abuse and neglect, what you happen is part of the brain is missing. Now, people think, like, that can't happen, but imagine what would happen if you don't use this arm. Like, pretend I never use this arm. It would get really skinny and thin and have contractures, and then I would quit being able to use it. It would not develop. The same thing happens to the brain, even though it's not muscle. So we do have data on when children are orphaned 
um, in terms of one or both parents dead, what is their risk of abuse? Because the upside down triangle makes it look like all those categories are separate, but they're really not. Often, a, a child who's lost one or both parents, that they don't really have someone taking care of them, and they're really vulnerable to the abuse. So I'm just going to call your attention to the experienced sexual violence in childhood on the left and the sexual violence males in the middle, just the sexual violence ones. Who has the pointer? Oh, <laughs> aren't you wonderful? Um, okay. Oh, I'm showing it there. Uh, this way? Okay. Got it, got it. Okay. So here you see the orange is um, single orphans and the gray is double orphans, but you can see your increased risk of experiencing sexual violence if you've lost one or both parents if you're a girl. And here you're also at increased risk of experiencing sexual violence if you're a boy, even though boys do not experience as much sexual abuse as girls do. But like we, we've got to really be you know, we have a lot of opportunities to be paying attention to this and a lot of reasons why. And again, some of you heard me say this earlier, but what would happen if we combine the wisdom of science and of the scriptures and the revelation of the Holy Spirit? How much farther could we go and could we get? Now, I was just in another session, and I had a question that was very helpful from a very respected leader that said, like, the world is trying to pour things in us that are so negative, you know, pornography, bombarded with sexual images, etc. And like, should the church really be using things that are of the world? And um, I, I, it's so interesting because I, you know, you often later think, oh, I should have said this, but um, that's what happened. Uh, so we have the chance to build bridges about the things that unite us or walls that would separate us permanently. And I think that we have a lot of things that unite us. And the example is, like, if, if I had um, brain cancer, would I want to go to the best brain cancer surgeon or would I want to just go to my friend who's a Christian who does know something about um, the brain? Of course you would want to go to the best brain cancer surgeon. And I feel like that... Um, this abuse is like a cancer that is killing children invisibly from the inside. And we actually know a lot about what could prevent it. And we can learn from what we know and avoid those parts that would be um, inconsistent with our Christian values. So this is the INSPIRE package that I talked about earlier. These seven strategies have been shown to protect children from violence. I implement laws, N, norms and values, S, um, safe environments, P, parenting life support, I, income and economic strengthening, R, response and uh, support services, and E, education and life skills. Um, so in the handbook, we do highlight the Inspire package on the left, but I also wanted to let you know there are two companion um, volumes also available online you could use for free. It was um, created and endorsed by the 10 lead global organizations that work on the problem. And including UNICEF, UN Office of Drugs and Crime, CDC, PEPFAR, USAID, etc. Um, the measures for are these things working is found in this indicator package. And the handbook actually has a, a one-page description of each of the programs mentioned that you can link to and often find slide sets and other things you can use. So. Um, I don't want you to do much with this page other than look at it a minute because here you see the seven strategies that I just mentioned on the left. The approach column is actually uh, the description of the kind of things that, that work are important. And the sector means if you're working with the government, which arm of the government would you work with? So obviously, just for an example, implement laws. You're going to work with the legal sector, right? So on one page, you basically have an overview of all the different kind of programs that work, what part of the government would be the one that you would work with if you were wanting to work with the government, and what is the topic area. So this is what we're going to do in this session. I'm going to... Um, spend a short time, probably 15 minutes, just giving you an overview. And then Gilbert has had experience um, in his leadership of World Vision in Tanzania now and previously leading World Vision in, in Uganda in um, how you can take Inspire and how it can be useful and applicable for the church, which is what I think is going to be really helpful for everyone in here. So, but um, let me first of all um, 
just say what, a little bit more about what is in your handbook and what is in this INSPIRE package. So first, implement and enforce laws. So the approaches are certainly that you want to make sure the essential things that are most important for protecting children are laws banning violent punishment, laws criminalizing sexual abuse, Laws that prevent alcohol misuse. There are a number of countries that actually limit the amount of alcohol that can be purchased on a Friday and a Saturday night. It's very interesting. And um, in those countries that do that, the rates of sexual abuse of children are lower. It's just fascinating um, and encouraging. And then also lo lo uh, laws that limit use access to firearms because for boys, one of the main causes of violence is violent injury through firearms or knives or weapons and fighting. So that's important. Um, there are a number of groups that don't feel comfortable using a program unless they they can feel like um, there's a Bible verse that would make them uh, feel like it, it's consistent with principles of Scripture, and I think that's um, something really helpful to include. So we also include in each little section of the handbook uh, a passage from Scripture that we think is important and relevant. Like here for the laws, let everyone be subject to the gover governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. And if you're in a country that doesn't have the laws you need, also it would be really helpful to try to work on making them. So one of the things that we have in the Inspire package for implement and enforce laws and policies is something that actually can help churches. A lot of churches don't have any safe... Um, safeguarding policies for children. So this Safe Sanctuaries um, program that was developed by the Global Methodist Church, reducing the risk of abuse in the church for children and youth, is one of the stronger ones. And so that is outlined. And then um, one of the things that gives, um, I think, the church a bad reputation, if you, there's a recent study done um, uh, through a, by a secular university about whether the net contribution of the church is beneficial or detrimental for children in this whole area of abuse. And it found that 90% per helpful but 10% detrimental. And the 10% detrimental was not adequately protecting children who have been abused in terms of unbeing willing to report it when people in the church know about it and unwilling to get help for the children. So th there also is in the link some descriptions about if you don't have a safe policy, like safe, uh, a child safeguarding policy in your churches, what do you need to do to develop it? So that's what this is. I want to share with you that with my job with the CDC, I, and I work in a number of countries with PEPFAR, um, in, including a number of them represented in the room, but it was pretty disappointing and shocking to me to, we reviewed a number of policies in 10 countries this past year, um, and a number of policies from the churches, the Catholic Church, the Episcopal Church, the Pentecostal Church, the Methodist Church, etc. One of the biggest countries and one of the biggest um, denominations, this is what their policy said. If you think someone is being abused in your church, and like in you are a Sunday school teacher, report it to the lead religious leader. And if that lead religious leader thinks it's a problem, then he needs to report it up to the district religious leader. And then if the district religious leader thinks it's a problem, they need to report it up to the national religious leader. Like, do you know how much they mentioned, like, report it to the authorities? Zero. Can I tell you, does that count as a safeguarding policy? No. So, like, this is something you might think, oh, this is so boring, safeguarding policies. It, it might sound boring, but it can mean the difference in that child getting help or not getting help and the abuse continuing or not continuing. And I have lots more stories about that I could tell, but because I want Gilbert to have time. Gilbert, can you tell me when I've, when, um, when it's half, how much more time do I have? 15, roughly? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, go ahead. I will. You. Okay, so norms and values. These are the kinds of things that can be really important for the approaches that work. Um, changing the adherence to very restrictive gender norms and social norms. A lot of, um, in a lot of countries, it's still considered acceptable that men would physically or sexually abuse women. Those are the kind of things that really need to be changed. Um, and some of the top um, Christian leaders, again, in these 10 countries said, what we really need is um, faith leaders and Christian leaders 
to be helping men understand transformational masculinity. It was just so fascinating that when we would ask, like in Zimbabwe, we asked the heads of all the top denominations in the whole country, the general secretary, five of them, what do you think would really help stop AIDS and HIV AIDS in your country? And they said, easy, transformational masculinities. And I thought, that is so refreshing to hear U.S. believers saying that. Because, you know, if men have a sense of how to respect women, they're not going to be raping them, and, you know, they're not going to be abusing them. And um, if there's a sense of dignity and respect, which is a lot of what you're talking about, life would be a lot different. This community mobilization programs, often if you have just programs in the community that change the norms, radio, billboards, etc., that can also be really effective. Okay, then a verse that's really helpful for us when we're thinking about norms and values is there's neither Greek nor Jew, male nor female, but you are all one in Christ. And then also wisdom that comes from above is, first of all, pure, then peace-loving, then considerate. You getting in that second verse some of the transformational masculinities idea and you're getting in the first verse that men and women have equal value before God and if so needed to be treat need to be treated with respect I'll say one thing about this norms and values the program that we have um, that is highlighted in the inspire package leads to a 64 percent reduction in children actually witnessing the father beating the mother at home and that, that, is how, that happens in a lot of cultures. And um, it's really nice because this one actually has a Christian version that the Catholic Church developed that's excellent. It has all the slides, all the posters, all the questions, everything that you would need to use. And it has been implemented in a number of churches and can easily be adopted across cultures. When we say something is evidence-based, I want to just say what that means. It means that a large group of people participated in the program and then were followed for a year after it was finished and it's a several year program to see how commonly it was for rape to occur in in the people who participated and then a large comparison group who got nothing were also followed to see how often rape was committed and was there a significant reduction in the experimental group who did the program um, when it's compared with the other group that got nothing. And that's what we saw, 62% reduction. And it's really neat that it's available in a Christian, this is it, so, uh, Raising Voices, free online, links in the um, World Without Orphans Handbook, and it's a Christian program. Safe environments. Um, one of the things that we're really working on a lot is this interrupting the spread of violence online. It is so common, especially... Um, this exploitation of children online, it's getting worse and worse. And then um, just in terms of one verse that talks about safety, during Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel from Dan to Beersheba lived in safety, everyone. UNICEF has a very simple resource. It's short, but it has the principles that are really important. Staying safe online, and it emphasizes the importance of parents um, if the kids are interacting with phones online, parents knowing about it, parents involved with it, and not just kind of this free, unlimited, and unsupervised access to um, online uh, information. So parent and giver, uh, caregiver support, whether it's delivered in group settings or individually or part of combined services uh, programs with schools, it's very, uh, those are very effective. And there are certain ones that are effective, others that are not shown to be effective. And we know from the scriptures repeated injunctions about things like mothers tenderly care for your children, fathers exhort and encourage them, and these programs encourage those kinds of things. Again, the reduction in child abuse among the group, the groups over many years who got programs like this were nearly half. You, so um, you can see these reductions are the kinds of things that make the programs in the hand in the hand in the roadmap that we have um, passed on to you different from your run-of-the-mill program that hasn't been evaluated. Uh, this is an example of one of the programs that's going to be showcased here called Parenting for Lifelong Health, and they do 12 different lessons. Sorry that you, you're kind of not seeing it on the left, but um, defining goals, building warmth and special time, praise, talking about emotions, what do we do when we're angry, putting out fires, problem solving, making family budgets, dealing with problems without conflicts. Two sessions on that cause um, 
it's really hard to deal with conflicts healthily. Family rules and routines, making a savings plan, keeping teens safe, responding to crisis, and widening circles of support. These are implemented often in churches, and even though there's um, comprehensive training for them, uh, the nice thing about this is we were able to make all of the materials, the facilitator's guide and the parent's guide, free, clickable on in the roadmap. So if you go to the prevention section and you look under um, P for parenting and you go to the resources at the bottom, this is one of them and you would have everything that you need. The nice thing about this is um, it's created with images for low literacy audiences. It has been used mo it mostly in African settings, but it's now also being used in Asia and South America. So if you're from Asia and you need um, access to the Asian version, um, if you can contact me, I know the people that can get it for us. So uh, next, income and economic strengthening. So often it's the poverty that um, places children at risk for vulnerability because a single mom leaves and is working and no one at all is home you know, um, supervising the children. So we know that if uh, cash transfer or savings and loan programs can reduce, um, again, this um, seeing the father beating the mother, seeing intimate par partner violence by half. It, we're really excited because the best um, income strengthening program that um, I honestly think there is, and I've reviewed like hundreds of them, and reviewed the valuations of hundreds of them, is this Restore Savings Church Facilitator's Guide, which is produced by Hope International after years of experience. And it's really exciting because it um, it is a uh, church-based guide that has scripture verses in it, and it's, it's run through church-based small groups, and they have uh, found it to be very effective in... Um, Helping, pe helping people um, be able to keep their children in school, for example, which is a key pre preventive factor for violence. And then response and support services. So the things that we're going to see in here are things like um, counseling that is um, called cognitive behavioral therapy. Actually, some of the training that Ruby does touches on some of these things, even though it's not complete. But Individuals get, that get counseling can have a 37% reduction in all the trauma symptoms from being abused. And often group therapy is even more effective. So again, that we know those kinds of things work. And education and life skills, um, certainly keeping kids in school helps protect them, as I just said. But the life skills, just helping kids know how, like, signs that of maybe danger, like what kind of... Uh, interactions with friends are healthy or unhealthy. And Gilbert will talk a little bit more about that. But again, we can, we've can we seen that it, um, that programs for selected students like uh, can reduce the danger by th uh, things like binge drinking or things like being exposed to abuse by 33%. For all students, 25%. But the bro program that is life skills related that Gilbert is going to review, they even had better results when it was done by Christians in a Christian setting. And coaching boys into men is what he showed. So we have a number of countries. If, we, if you look at the map in your program of the number of countries that are um, engaging with World Without Orphans, you know, almost the whole front of the program is blue if you open the page. Not the Inspire package, but the program. And um, the governments in those countries, um, I would say about two-thirds of them already have Inspire training that's being done by the government. So sometimes you can leverage off of governments to get some of this training done. But we're hoping as training goes up, for what works to prevent violence, the actual abuse in the yellow will be going down. So that's all for me. And Gilbert, you can you can go ahead. Thank you. Um, before that, anyone has any for now for clarification? As I said that, so that we maximize time. Or you have no questions? Are we good? Okay, Gilbert, come on. I think we're good. No, no, no. Wait, wait. Gilbert and I have been friends for a couple years, so. Yeah, that, uh, that, uh, like, uh, you know, when you start, but then to stop it becomes very difficult. Uh, so sometimes others feel like that. When we say time is up, that's when hands go up. But 
anyone has any question or any comment from what she has said? What is what you're feeling from what she has said? No, you can have a seat. So you can have a seat. Anyone? Any reaction or you don't have can any? I said, can, um, who thinks that there's anything that we talked about that could be used in your country? Just raise your hand. Anybody? Ah, okay. Okay, Good. that's great. The seven points are very useful in our country, in India, in terms of, yeah, 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 yeah. This one, right? Yes, seven. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, this, this seven points, yes. Yes. Um, and could you envision them being used in churches or more in NGOs or secular settings? We are using mostly in the NGOs, in the Christian ministries, yeah. in the churches also. Okay. Yeah. Like it's people don't talk about it. It's very quiet. Things happen underground. Even though you mentioned Swaziland has the highest abuse rate, I mean it's it's huge. It's it's terrible. Um, but I think so. I think a lot of these things can help uh, help people have the tools to ask the right questions to then be able to find out what are the dangers, what are the challenges that are going on for the youth. That way, then, then we then we can develop programs to then address those challenges. So I think a lot of the time it's not knowing what we should know. So. Um, I'm in China, um, and I think the norms and social thing could be a huge thing. Um, all of the kids in the orphan orphanages um, have special needs, and there's just a huge, um, yeah, they just don't know what to do with that. There's not the resources, and parents are just overwhelmed by that. Um, and I think the laws as well, um, it's illegal to officially give your child up for adoption, so it all happens behind the scenes, which results in a lot of children being abandoned. Um, and so you're not, how to say, it's hard to intervene because it's already happened. And so I feel like there, there could be some, change. yes. I'm blue. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, you, 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 you. Please go ahead. Go ahead. I don't have a comment. That's a question. Um, um, our organization, we have last few years, have especially child protection um, trainings, and then required and ask our partners, which are churches and Christian organizations, to make their own child protection policies. So we are on a good track. They have been doing that. But what is your experience? How common is it that Christian organizations and churches have their own child protection policies? Okay. Um, I yep, I think, I think we oh, so. I can answer that question. Um, uh, now, repeatedly, um, it's much more common for, uh, for them to have a policy Often, unfortunately, the policy is in someone's cabinet and um, the other people don't know about it. So there, the policy may exist, but it may be um, considered uh, inadequate. Like the one I described about you just report up and up and up and up to the top religious leader in the country, but you don't ever report to the government. Um, Another example I'm going to give that is actually really heartbreaking is the very top evangelical leader in a country I won't name because then you could figure out who it is and I don't want, you know, I just don't think that's right for me to do that. But I highly respect the man. He is highly respected nationally, inside and outside of Christian circles. And so when we were talking with him about, like, what is the state of this in his country, he said... This is a heartbreaking problem, and I'll tell you an example that just came to me. There was a 17-year-old girl in our church, 
and the um, youth leader thought she was having lesbian tendencies. And so in our church, what happens is you kick a child out of the church, if you see that. So the youth leader brought the child to me because they thought maybe I would help and try to understand what was happening. And I talked to the young girl and learned. She had been orphaned at nine, had been taken in by the aunt who had um, two older sons. The only place for the girl to sleep was in the same bedroom with the two older sons. She had been raped from nine to 17 repeatedly by both of those boys. Never told anybody, never got any help. She's moving out and getting ready to go to college when all of this comes. It only becomes discovered because the man, um, rather than thinking, oh, I'm going to kick you out, he tried to figure out, like, what is, what is going on here? And, like, tell me a little bit about what's happening in your life. So when that happened, then we asked, like, well, like, what did you do? And he said, well, we have policies, but you see, the woman is a pillar in our church, and I could not bear the thought of reporting this because of this was this is considered incest in our country and all the shame that would come on the woman. So what was so sad to me, several things, is there was no mention of the boys because by this time if the girl's seventeen and the boys are older, they're they're adults. And um so th that was heartbreaking. Another thing that was heartbreaking is the seventeen year old said, and there are still children in the home. And it's happening to the other children that are there. I know it. They've told me. Uh, so nothing was said about the perpetrators. Not, there was not enough conviction to help the children that are still there to report it. And, um, you know, when he said, well, the reason is this woman is a pillar in our church, I began to understand um, this uh, principle that the best interest of the child needs to drive our decision making is weak and the sec even when po policies are strong um, and then um, often w what I think is the root of it is there needs to be some kind of um, relationship between the faith leaders and the child protection leaders and even the police because there need if you know the people that are trustworthy that you're going to report to you're much more apt to report to them than if you don't know them at all and you're worried about what might happen. So that's a long answer to your question, but basically, often churches have the policies, often they don't um, implement them. And Thank we'll you. take one. We'll no, no, we'll take, we'll take another one at the end. Take another one at the end because you, okay. you may answer all the questions. Keep the mic, keep the mic. Okay, you go. So, uh, my name is Gilbert. Some, I think, one or two were in the previous session where I, I, I talked about similar but not the same. Uh, so, you, you get a different. Uh, version. Uh, I work for World Vision in Tanzania, but I was in Uganda. Originally, I'm from Malawi, uh, so I, I live now in Tanzania, where I work for World Vision as national director. What I want to share with you in these few minutes is about uh, what has been the experience of World Vision uh, with Inspire, uh, both in Uganda and in Tanzania, where I've worked recently. Because you, you, you asked a question, I just want to highlight here. Uh, these uh, frameworks which are, or the strategies which are, uh, Susan has highlighted. And for sure, uh, if you look at them, you will see that uh, they don't look very strange. They are things which are common. Okay? Uh, that's where I want to start from. That the Inspire framework is not something which has come from out there. They have just summarized them for a better communication to each one of us. And if you look at these strategies, you may not work in all of them, but in some of them. But if you are to be complete, you need to have this set. Not in one organization or one church group, but as a, as a national or as a community, you need to be working around these issues. But also, it's good to, to see what is a problem, what is the main dominant problem in your area around this area. So the assessment you do will guide to see what is the real problem and you focus on that. So what I want to, to highlight with this slide here uh, is that you see uh, what I didn't put here is the inspired whether it is coming up there. Now World Vision as an entity is a child focused organization 
focusing on the well-being of the most vulnerable children, creating a brighter future for the most vulnerable children, measuring the impact in the outcomes in the domain of children. One, that children should be educated for life. Secondly, children should enjoy good health. Third, that children should be protected. And the fourth one, that children should experience the love of God and that of their neighbor. In whatever we do, that's what we want to measure our outcomes or our impact. Do we achieve all of them? Maybe not, or to some degree. So if you come to issues of uh, child protection, what vision has its own model? Uh, we call that child protection and advocacy, which is very much aligned to inspire. Okay? And also what vision has our own model or an, a campaign which we call It Takes a World to End Violence Against Children, which is more about partnership, collaboration. We allow that you cannot, you cannot end violence against children by yourself. So as churches, as church organizations, we need to realize that you cannot end violence against children by yourself. So the question then, then why did World Vision implement Inspire? If what we are doing, so if I can go here, maybe we'll start from here, you will see that, uh, so this is Inspire. This is what World Vision, part of summary of our work which we do. So if you look at, I will not repeat what you're talking here, but you see community awareness, consolidation, legal framework, support values. You can break down all these into the seven. But I, I went further to see from the other slide here. Uh, so if you look at, uh, for example, I'll not go through all of them. If you look at the issue of uh, uh, implementing laws and inf I mean implementation enforcement of laws, we have a model we call decision voice and action or implementation of law, policies and standards, accountability mechanism. Again, collaboration in partnership uh, for policy influence. That's what we do. So I would say we are within the Inspire. Let me use another example. I can pick, I, I'll just pick another. Let me pick a, a response and support. You see here, uh, what we do is that uh, we do referrals to, to specialized organization because what vision is that we are not a specialized organization. So sometimes you have an abused child. What do you do? From that aspect of response. We also uh, do support to national helpline. Uh, so we, we have to set up the helplines in that country. Now, then we say you are doing everything. But then, uh, one thing I like about uh, Susan, we met in uh, Ottawa. So I, I give a bit of, I tell you one story. So what Susan said, you know, what vision, uh, we're looking at child protection discussion by going about WHO. So Susan said, but what vision, you're doing a very good work, but you're not mentioned in Inspire. No, what vision, if you look at the book of Inspire, we're not mentioned there. And yet, if you look at the work which we do, not that I'm bragging about, but I'm just honest under the blood of Christ that we are doing much more child protection issues than those who are mentioned there. I will not mention who. But there's one reason why we are not mentioned. That's why I want to, why I'm talking about here. We are not mentioned because we have good stories and not evidence. So that's why she told me here. You have to know that not every good story is evidence. So why I am here today it will encourage us as pastors, church people, church organizations, that we may have very good stories, but they are not evidence. So what vision Uganda uh, decided to implement some of the models which are tested to proven to lead to results, that we implement them so that we can be included in the evidence. Why? It is important because you can use it for engagement, you can use it for uh, resource mobilization, you can use it for influence. So that's why we, I, uh, like national director, I decided in, in Uganda, I would try one of the models. And one of them was coaching boys to men. And how did it come about? Uh, CDC headquarters, PEPFA and others were visiting Uganda. We talked about DREAMS, another project for uh, girls. Are empowering girls so that they are determined, resilient, achievable, and, and that, that's the acronym for PEPFA. So I said in that meeting that in as much as we are doing for girls, we need also dreams for boys. Why? Because as most of you know, 
there is a problem of transition of boys from children to Badavila to Babadan and, and, and so forth. And studies have shown that a teenage boy and a teenage girl are different, whether you like it or not. Whether If you just leave them there, they will be different. And then the challenge comes that uh, most of the boys tend to develop from a man box. Okay, what I, I would call a man box. This man box is what? This man box is powerful, strong, pleasure-seeking, uh, don't get advice, you need advice. That's the box where they come from. And then you take them into this society, then all oh, they see, oh yeah, that way I'm a man, and then things go wild. So that's why we wanted to test this model uh, of coaching boys to men. Because in as much as we are doing all this work, which is okay, uh, and there's nothing wrong with this work, to be honest. And there's nothing wrong with your churches you're doing and most other organizations. It's fantastic. But the key message is, let us not shun away from scientific proven models, which are out there, which you can just speak and apply. But that's all I am here to motivate you that we have done it as a faith-based organization. We have seen it works. I am happy that when CDC is meeting, now they are talking that in Uganda, what vision did this? And yet, I'll be honest with you, we have only done in one district in Uganda. And we're operating in f over 40 districts in Uganda. <clears throat> but because what we implemented contributed to the evidence, we can be talked about. That, that's what I want to encourage you about. So if I was to have no time, I would end there. Uh, but because I have one or two things, let me see. Yeah, we still have time. We're stooping at five, correct? Yes. Yes, so we have plenty of time. We'll finish in, so that we can have a discussion. So, that, that's what I, I talked about. So, in, in Uganda 2017, we decided together uh, with the support from uh, our colleague from WHO, CDC, and the government of Uganda that we'll try out coaching boys to men. Um, and then, if I may jump ahead, this year, because of the success of that program, we have also decided to implement coaching boys to men in Tanzania, in the two regions in the southern part of Tanzania. The reason, for, uh, the difference though now is that uh, in Uganda we implemented more uh, or mainly through community and government structure, but in Tanzania now we are equipping the church to implement coaching boys to men. So we are not the one implementing, but we will be training, we are training and equipping the church groups to be the one implementing coaching boys to men. So what is it? Coaching boys to men, as it is, uh, it's just an, an evidence-based uh, model, including the Inspire, uh, designed to inspire athletic coaches to mentor their young male athletes. Now, challenges I've said, but where there are no dreams, we can also talk about female athletes. So, so don't, don't confuse that because we're talking about men. Uh, but, so I talked about dreams, which is for girls, now, coaching boys to men is for boys. You can then say that uh, you can also coach girls to women, not to wives, though, because we're not coaching. Uh, well, that's another challenge you had in Uganda when we said coaching boys to men. The committee says, which men? We know these men which are here, they are not very good. So where are you coaching them to? Uh, so sometimes using approach language also matters an explanation. So... Coaching boys into men is a methodology which is owned by uh, Future Without Violence. They own the trademark. Uh, but it is a researched uh, model, and they are allowing everybody to use it if you want to. You just need to write an email, and then you agree. Uh, the only there are some uh, issues which I want to talk about that one, if you want to make reference that your work which you have done is, a, is because of coaching boys to men, then you need to be trained by them as a master trainer. You need to have a master trainer. So have a certification process to be a master trainer. My gut feeling is, if you want change, you can apply it. Okay? If you want change, that things should be different, you can apply it. But if you want to say in your literature and whatever you write that it's because we did this with, uh, because of coaching boys to men, then they need to say, to say who, who was conducting the training. It's the issue about the master, master trainer. 
Right. Um, I think I will not. So, in Uganda, this is what happened. Uh, which, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Susan was referring to. So, here, if you look here, uh, num percent of athletes that do not accept any form of violence. At baseline was 42%, and at end line in May 2019 was 85%. By following, uh, I'll explain this basic uh, handbook, I mean, cards, which there are 12 cards here. Uh, I'll explain what, what, what they are. And uh, here, if I pick another one, um, percent of boys who regard boys and girls to have equal rights. Before the session at baseline was 55%, and at end line was 87%. Now, again, let me emphasize that both baseline and end line were done by external consultants. It wasn't done by World Vision, because it wanted to be independent, and that can be used uh, by others. Much more to motivate others that they can do it also. Now, if you can imagine this is only in one district, what if you did across the district? It will be quite significant a reduction. Uh, so uh, another one here, proportion of boys who feel that their school is safe, is a safe place. At the uh, baseline was 64, at Ireland was 98%. Now, Susan talked about the more training you do, you're anticipating that the actual violence goes down. This is a key indicator that violence is going, is going down in schools. And then you can pick up a number. Let me pick another one who... I think the, the, the ones that actually experienced it. The three, uh, uh, that one, uh, right there. Um, yeah. Up one. This one? Right there. Yep. Uh, percent of girls and boys who have experienced sexual violence in school. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, these, these cards are. Maybe go to number seven because of time. Training seven, not prayer, but training seven. Or any one of which you can pick. Okay, bragging about sexual reputation. This training will help athletes, one, recognize that bragging or lying about their sexual reputation is disrespectful and wrong. Mm -hmm. Number what? two, recognize that spreading stories about someone else's sexual activity can be disrespectful and harmful. Number three, refuse to spread private information or to speak disrespectfully about another person's sexual reputation. Now, to some of us who have forgotten our teen time or did not engage in those behaviors, you may think that's not important. But you can see that uh, teenage boys tend to brag about sexual life, sometimes even lying. You know that girl there, I went with that girl. You know that, but are you sure you did? Uh, but because girl, boys also have this tendency that if, and in respect of culture, by the way, that if this girl, boy went with this girl, I can also go with that same girl. So that's why these topics are important. And what we have discussed with the future of that violence is that uh, can we not add something to it? And one of the things we are adding is about what, in what vision we call it empowered worldview uh, to ensure that we do biblical reflections, biblical basis, so that the discussion is not just about cognitive, about psychology and everything, but also about spiritual well-being. And especially now that we are working through the churches, that is possible. One of the things also we have done is to adapt uh, some of the language. Well, some of the languages are not culturally sensitive. We need to change them to ensure that they reflect what the context is without diluting uh, the message. So what are the key messages? Key messages I'm raising colleagues is that uh, Coaching boys into men is part of the models recommended inspire strategies for ending violence against children. It's clear. We can work around that. But, and if we are looking at having a world without orphans, we cannot emphasize enough, one of the keys is let's prevent children becoming orphans. Some of them, as we put it, it's just abusive relationships. They have their parents, but they have abusive relationships. But if we can avoid those things sometimes, uh, we, we will uh, end. And the other point is that uh, church leaders who, are passion, who have a passion to end violence against, I mean, to have a word of that often should adopt such models which produces results within a short period of time and a sustained result. As I put here, you can see a large majority, this is an evaluation report uh, which talks about that uh, a large majority or a large majority of athletes, 92%, reported that they do not accept any form of violence now compared to 41% at prior to the project intervention. I think that, to me, is proof enough that we can run with this such program. It's not only this one. There are many others. And I, again, let's, let's be real that we're not just talking about coaching boys to men. You can have another program. There is, I mean, talked about Sinovuyo, there is uh, many which you can look at. No means no. Uh, we have what we also call uh, health kiosks uh, within because which looked at where are the men, uh, creating men forums uh, in these churches because in most churches we have women forum but not men forum. And when they go to talk, what should they talk about? Uh, some of these cards can be adapted during at Sunday school, could be at the seven groups, could be whatever you can, it doesn't need to be sport uh, per se. Uh, the key is do you have a volunteer who is willing to engage these young people consistently at least once a week for 15 to 20 minutes. I think that's where I would end for now, unless you have other questions, and we will have questions if you don't. What is your reaction? What is your comment? We still have time. We still have 15 minutes before 5. Doesn't mean we'll stay, we can go now, but we still have time. So, in my household, there's me, now me and my wife, uh, but uh, we have two children, uh, they are 27 and 24. Uh, but silence in our house means anger or fear. 
Uh, so if one is annoyed, he will tend to pretend to be quiet. Uh, but nobody will like to talk. So please talk to me, otherwise I think you are afraid <laughs> or you are, you are annoyed. So please talk to me. Any, any questions or comments on what she has talked? Because what I would do is to give some example that these things which the scientists uh, talk about, they work. And for us as a church, our duty is to make it work. Let's just take it up, run with it, and the results will come. Right. We have a multiplying effect. Yes. I, I, I would like to share from my uh, own experience and perspective and also relate to your uh, previous questions about uh, how many of us can think uh, that this can apply to our country. Yes, I, for Thailand, uh, I experienced that we have a program like this a lot. And actually, uh, but it's more in the um, NGO and not the faith-based organization. You know, and the challenge is, um, and this is what why I, I, I would like to be the bridge between the uh, faith-based organizations and churches with the government or uh, uh, not, uh, not a Christian NGO to working together and also with the science. Because a lot of times I, I, I receive the question, because I ran the program, I'm, by the way, I'm, um, I'm come from Chiang Mai, I'm Thai, and I'm a founder and a lawyer. Uh, working at the uh, Upstream Family and Community Learning Center. We try to um, encourage uh, churches and people in the communities to, um, to have a holistic care for vulnerable children and family. But what I experience is oftentimes when I come to churches, to churches and they were asking, is this a Christian, uh, uh, what Christian concept? You know, and when then they think like, oh, the the trainer or or the res these resources did not come from uh, Christian context or it's from a science. They think some of the churches or or or, or, or um, a Christian leader they think science is against Christ, against God. So something many, many times they said, no, we we not accept or we're not going to use this materials or this program in our churches because it's not related to, related to uh, a, a Christian context. And, and also, um, there have, we, there's some, some barrier or, or negative attitude toward the government or the NGO uh, with the churches in, 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 especially in local area. So, you know, this is, I think this is a challenge, how we can uh, encourage or empower or, or raise awareness on all this and, and make Christian welcome the um, uh, science research or, you know, or the, the program to outside of Christianity to use in churches. Um, thank you so much for that question. It's a really important one. So, um, there's two um, there's uh, two things I want to share, and then I'd love for you to share, and I'd love to hear from others of you. Sometimes I'm finding it helpful in these kind of conversations that um, I have to, particularly being a scientist by training and working in the government and then serving um, in the church. And um, but sometimes if you ask someone, like if you if you had cancer, would you want to go to the best cancer doctor, or would you just want to go to you know? So um, sometimes that helps. Um, additionally, however, I would say that um, I think it's I think it's normal for believers to want to have a sense that when you're trying to implement something, you want confidence. Is this consistent with the scriptures and with our values? So it's very interesting that um, even like really one of the best norms change programs, the SASA one that I mentioned, the Catholic Church adapted it and just incorporated Bible verses into it. I think, Gilbert, like you're going to do with Coaching Boys into Men now in Tanzania through the churches. So then if, as it's pretty easy to do because if something is valuing respect and dignity and thoughtfulness and compassion, you know, we have plenty of um, scriptural passages that are that support those same things. So it's I mean, I mean, honestly, my dream is that these kinds of things that we know work that are more in the social scientist science area would be adapted and would have as companions the scriptural verses that support them, just like Gilbert's going to do, just like the Sasa Faith one is going to do. Um, 
some of the parenting ones, it would be so easy to strengthen them with the biblical basis for some of the um, things that are mentioned. So I think that one of the things you could do is begin to talk about, we know these things work. Would you want to be someone who would help um, integrate into it some of the biblical passages that support it? I would also add that um, recently in Tanzania, we had a, a, a gathering for all mother bodies of Christians in Tanzania. Uh, there are five main groups, and each one of them, about five or seven people, came together. And one of the questions I, I was raising there is that uh, the theology of poverty is that of Christ, whether you like it or not. You could be Pentecostal, you could be whatever. If you're looking about poverty, you're looking at the poverty of the theology, <laughs> that is the theology of Christ. Uh, let's follow what the Lord would have done if he sees a poor person. Uh, so that, that's fundamental point number one. Number two is that uh, through my experience with World Vision, I have learned that uh, shame and naming doesn't work. Uh, it's, it's engagement. Invite those church leaders to engagement. Uh, uh, some of times you use other church leaders to come and, and support your point of view because so that you can move on. Uh, as you put it, uh, Susan, Talk about scripture. What does scripture say? Allow scripture to talk to people. Pray about it. But again, as we say, whether you like it or not, what you need is a changed life. It's not that you bring secularism into the church. Uh, as, as we say, these, these, these cards you see there, they are context for Uganda. They are not the original uh, text for future that white violence. Some of them we changed them because we couldn't take them. Tanzania, we are doing the same. We have taken the original cards and I have taken this one from Uganda. I have said here, can you review them? We have also invited the church because we are working with the churches to review these materials. So what they agreed upon with future of that violence, what vision and the church is a vision which is appropriate according to the context without diluting the message. There are some which I've removed completely uh, because of the context. So to me, it is that issue that uh, one, as, as Christian, let's not be tired. It said, don't be tired in doing good. So what you are doing is good. Keep on pushing the boundary until some change I will occur. Then uh, one or two questions before we pray. I prefer closing these sessions with prayer. Some of you would ask us to, you ask you to pray for, for this session.